You have all the time you need, sir. And now the second extra. Thank you. 25 years ago, I had the good fortune of playing a character in a film called Midnight Cowboy. Uh, I was rehearsing this speech here yesterday, and I came in here today and just found out that the wonderful, lovely, talented man who sang, everybody's talking in that movie, Harry Nielsen, died today. And it would seem weird not to have an appropriate moment for him. He was a great artist. Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear words they're saying. Only the echoes of my mind. Most of the time when I mention his name, people go, who? When you say Harry Nielsen, everybody says, no, Harry Nielsen, either they, they get it right away or they have no idea. Me and my arrow. He brought originality to the ear. I mean, tr no copying anybody. He was the closest thing to an American version of the Beatles. Beautiful, beautiful voice. Soft, velvety. And you'd have your headphones on and that voice would come through. You almost couldn't play, because it was so beautiful, seriously beautiful. To me, he was always like a fallen angel. So there's this weird combination of, of something heavenly and beatific about him, and then just dirt <laughs> and, and darkness. One is the loneliest number that you ever do. Harry would turn up at your door at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you kind of knew that the next three days of your life <laughs> were going to be an adventure. I defer, Harry. Man, I don't know how far you want me to go with this. Put your line in the cooking, but you drink them both together. Put your line in the cooking, but the line in the cooking. Harry was a, a big bunny with really sharp teeth. Just the sweetest wonderful guy that could be the nastiest son of a bitch in two seconds right after that. He was his own worst enemy. I mean, just the drink and the drugs alone. He spent most of his life in pursuit of a good time, and he caught it, and uh, it caught him in the end. I was born Harry Edward Nilsson III on Father's Day, 1941. Well, in 1941, a happy father had a son. And by 1944, the father walked right out the door. And in 45, the mom and son were still alive. But who could tell in 46 if the two were to survive? It seems to me that it's pretty clear that Harry was profoundly disturbed by the fact that he was abandoned by his father. To not have had all the conversations with a father that one would want it would create, creates quite a, a longing heart. And he had that. Harry, who I think, really fought for legitimacy in many ways, uh, fought hard for it. My mother and I lived in an upstairs apartment with six rooms. We lived with my grandmother, my grandfather, two uncles, uh, my sister when she was born. That's the way we lived. Crowded, but busy enough not to get bored. I think my mother was always sort of like, uh, she wasn't a stage mother or anything, but I think she herself wanted to be in show business at one time. I think that sort of rubbed off on me. And uh, when I was a little 
child used to put me on the piano and have me sing songs to the adults, you know. I used to lay in bed when I was about 10 or 11, and in the solitude of the small dark room in Brooklyn, if I wasn't counting to a million or to infinity, I would put a pillow over my head and put on a show for an invisible audience. And now presenting me doing my impression of the great Al Jolson. And then I would mind Al Jolson. Mommy, how I love it, now I love it. Let me ask you, Harry Nielsen, and you do James Cagney. You dirty rat. Uh, how about Bing Crosby? Well, that's amazing. How about this guy? One time, Harry and I were both in New York at the same time, and he called me and asked me if I'd like to go out and see where he was born. It was a, a highly charged, emotional uh, event for both of us. The limousine took us out to Brooklyn. He couldn't give the directions, but he knew them when he got to the intersections. And we got lower and lower through more bridges and tunnels and dank alleys and back streets and garbage. and. Finally, we got to a place with a sooty brick wall and a sign that said, starve a rat, cover your garbage. Uh, he was shaking and weeping in the car because this was where he came from. It was obvious this was a very big reconciliation for Harry, something that he had been shelving for so long. It was the very thing that drove him a sense of poverty. They had financial troubles that had serious repercussions. When he was a kid, he had to eat dog food at one point. That's all they could afford. I know it was difficult for him. I mean, his mom was an alcoholic. She ultimately got sober and very fascinating woman. When you met her, you could see where Harry came from because she was like a bigger version of Harry in a lot of ways and same kind of outwardness and interest. She did pretty much whatever she had to do to survive. She took whatever job she had to. She lived where she had to. She even had to write some checks that uh, didn't always find their way to the bank and get paid. But at one point, they needed the rent money, and uh, he held up a liquor store. I don't know if you know that story or not. For $17, and <laughs> give me $17, you know. He was forced to do a lot of things as a young man. That made him, I suppose, stronger. It didn't weaken him, it just made him stronger and more self-reliant and more confident. The years went past him quickly, but not fast enough for him. So he closed his eyes till 55, then he opened them up again. And when he looked around, he saw a clown, and the clown seemed very gay. And he said, I'd like to join that circus clown and run away. My dad was like probably the only real father figure he had, you know, because he spent a few years with us. And my dad was just a regular, you know, regular dad, you know. And it was like a stable kind of thing in his life, you know, and he always had fond memories of that. It was 1957. It was June, a hot June. I lost my job as a caddy because of a fight pushing and shoving, nothing bad, but enough for the caddy master to fire me. When I went home that night, I told my aunt and uncle what had happened. And during dinner, my uncle said, Skeeter, I don't know how to say this gracefully, but I don't think we can afford you. I didn't hesitate. I simply said, you won't have to worry about me anymore. I left the house feeling like Holden Caulfield, half sad, half scared half itching to get on the road and start an adventure across country which would last me a lifetime. I was 15. Well, I followed every railroad track and every highway sign And he had a girl in each new town and the towns he left behind And the open road was the only road he knew But the color of his dream slowly turning into blue. I moved to California, to East LA, great improvement. And then the, my best friend uh, at the time, we were like the poor man's Everly Brothers. We had an old tape recorder, and we used to sing um, Everly-type 
tunes. Then we found out we were making up lyrics. So then we started adding, changing melodies. So we found out, oh, that, oh, now we're writing tunes, you know. I just turned 18, and I was a dropout. I worked at the Paramount Theater in Los Angeles for three years. I was assistant manager. Anyway, the cashiers were going to work for banks, and I figured since I was their boss, and I could reconcile books, so I went and made an application. I wasn't actually a banker. I used to run a computer center. 132 people were working on what we laughingly called the swing shift, you know, and then I supervised the handling of about $200 million a night in checks. I had to get off work about 1 o'clock in the morning and uh, go to the bar. We were up until 2 in Los Angeles and drink very quickly. I'd write songs all night. In the daytime, I'd hustle the songs and then go to work at the bank. I didn't stay up every other night for seven years, but I did stay up a lot of nights. My partner and I were, were in the office um, one particular day, and Harry came in and he said, what are you guys doing in here? And I said, oh, we're writing, and uh, we schmoozed for a little bit. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm a, I'm a singer and I'm a songwriter. I said, oh, great, uh, uh, play something. Sing, sing one of your tunes. It's just no good anymore when you walk through the door of an empty room and then you go inside and set a table for one. It's no fun when you spend a day without her. Do -do -do. I looked at my partner, and he looked at me, and we both understood that we were not supposed to respond the way we felt, because if we did, we would leap up in the air and, and, and give him the world to sign with our publishing company. So he finished his tunes, and I said, gee, that's great, Harry. And I said, would you be interested in a publishing arrangement? And he said, oh, yeah, man, that'd be great. I believe we paid him $50 a week to write for our publishing firm. And that was heavy bread for us. Can't go on without her. There's no song without her. Here comes the plane with the Beatles on it Look, there's John Paul, George, and Ringo One of them's taken, but three are single Two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar All for the Beatles to stand up and holler, yeah, yeah I was still working at the bank, and I, I hated the Beatles because I said, oh, shh, you know, they're beating me to the punch. And then there was that moment when you say, well, you're either with them or against them. And I decided to go for the latter, and I said, yeah, they really are that good. We'd be arguing about the Beatles, and he'd say, the Beatles are the only band. There's only one band. That's the Beatles. No one else matters. See, I just assumed that people would discover you, that they, they, they would spot in you the talent that I knew I had. I used to do demos and did jingles and uh, hung around with people who were in the business. You know, you meet one and he introduces you to a friend of his who knows a songwriter and somebody knows a producer. And then you, the ultimate uh, test is when you say, can I play you this? The Monkees were recording an album called Headquarters. And uh, it was the first album that we had been allowed to choose all our own material and record everything ourselves. I don't remember what happened behind the scenes, but this kid showed up named Harry Nielsen with a song called Cuddly Toy. You're not the only cuddly toy that was ever enjoyed uh, by any boy. You're not the only cheetah train that was left out in the rain the day of the second You're not the only cherry light that was left in the night and gave up without a fight. When Davy Jones said he would uh, record Cuddly Toy, the music publisher that was there, Lester Sill was the guy's name, he says, we walked outside in the parking lot and Lester said, you can quit the bank. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
in the center ring, presenting Nelson and his Shandamanium Shadow Pole. <laughs> It was difficult to find the right niche. It wasn't until he went over to RCA and got with Rick Gerard. I think that Rick Gerard really played a very important part in his success. I felt that Harry had incredible potential, that Harry could be a monster artist. And frankly, I was probably the only one that really believed that because he was so different. The thing about Harry that makes people feel good is his singing, his singing voice. He's a very, very, very good singer. He's the best singer of our generation. I mean, Harry's the best singer. I can't yell even here this morning With my eyes all on the wide And I'm awfully glad she let me come aside Do whack, do whack, do whack, do whack, do whack, do whack, do There's always been in American music a guy with a beautiful voice that, that uh, people loved. Uh, McCartney had it. It's a voice that people loved, and Harry had one too. I would say it was a medical instrument, his voice, because it would heal you. You felt an overwhelming wave of warmth from that voice. I think we were at least up to eight track by then, if not 16 track, and he could overdub himself. And he was so good at that, saying wonderful harmony lines off the top of his head. His voice blended great with himself, and uh, it just helped open up a whole new area for us to explore. A particular record was released with a lot of these overdubs, and a critic in reviewing the album said, it was a wonderful album and I love the music, but Nilsson should have credited the background singers. They were so great, not realizing the background singers were Nilsson. I remember at the time saying, Harry, be careful crossing the street, be careful just walking around, because this is going to be a big career, and we need you around. Derek Taylor was the um, publicist for the Beatles. And, and Derek was one of these guys. He was very like dashing, like Earl Flynn. I always thought of Derek as being Earl Flynn. And again, very, very bright. Bright, witty, uh, sophisticated. We were in Safeway car park on La Brea, and I went to, to do some shopping, and I came out, and Derek said, I just heard this incredible man singing a song called 1941. And he was just called Nilsson. The next thing I knew, Derek had got a dozen albums and he sent them to everybody he knew, including George and John and Paul and 
people in England, not because he represented Harry, but just because he loved him. So one day I was uh, early, it was five in the morning, I got a phone call and there's this voice long distance. Hello, hello, who is it? It's John, John who? It's John Lennon. Is this really John? He says, yeah, I just wanted to say you're fantastic, man. We listened to you all weekend, you know, he's great, great, great. You know, he's just fantastic. Uh, the following Monday, I got a phone call from Paul. How are you? Just calling to say you're fantastic. You know, he just oh, you're great, you know, and uh, you really love what you did and all that stuff. You know, Derek played it for us and hope to see you soon, and you know, clunk. The next Monday morning, I get up, comb my hair, five o'clock in the morning, waiting for a call from Ringo. There was no call. But he ended up being our best man at our wedding, so that's okay. Uh, now I would like to uh, uh, spend a few minutes and talk about song construction, which is one of the most important parts of songwriting. For any of those aspiring songwriters in the audience, I have a few comments to make. First of all, uh, in construction, I might say that you have to get to know your song. You gotta, gotta take it apart, put it back together again, keep it clean, because someday in combat it might save your life. And that's the, yes. <laughs> well, there's kind of this, this Stephen Foster, element to, to what he wrote that was a really sweet and sentimental. And I think that that he balanced that out with a with a with an edge. I've always thought of him as a musical poet. And his rhyme schemes and his words were just out of the ordinary. His range of writing is very broad. If you look at all the songs he's written, he's written all kinds of songs. And the things that he picked to write about at that time were subjects that regular pe most people were just writing about love. It was almost still post-war, all the writing. It was all love songs. But Harry was pushing the envelope. Sit beside the breakfast table Think about your trouble Pour yourself a cup of tea And think about the bubble Melodically, he had very experimental melodies that went from very low to very high. You know, he was an experimental melod melodist. He had a gift uh, for melody, uh, which is a rare, uh, inexplicable uh, sort of talent to have. I mean, people like McCartney has it, Schubert had it, uh, Elton John has it, and Harry had that, that gift. Listen to the wailing of the willow Listen to me crying on my pillow Crying for I know my love is gone from me I thought this was going to be really easy because I just, I just walked out of the bank and walked into the uh, recording uh, business and suddenly I was getting phone calls from Otto Preminger and John Lennon and all that. Is that all there is to it, you know? Nothing to it. Fantastic. I think I'll stay. <laughs> He gained a lot of confidence from that first album. A lot of confidence because I think he finally realized what he could do and what he could be as an artist and still remaining honest and true to himself. There was always a whimsical quality to Harry. But the thing that I love most is the sweetness. It was a sweetness and a joy and, and a sense of the world and nature. I mean, like when he writes about his desk, you know, he, he brings things to life. He had, he had that sense of whatever he touched or wrote about, suddenly sparkled. Now my old desk never needs a rest And I've never once heard it cry I've never seen it tease It's always there to please me from nine to five Such a comfort to know It's dependable and slow But it's always there well, it's the one friend I've got, a giant of our times, my good old dad. We just made that up. <laughs> good old desk was G O D. That was Harry's way of talking about God. 
He had a lot of conflicts about all of that business, and so he wrote a song called Good Old Desk, and that's the way his mind worked. And I loved that. I thought that was just so original. I was dialing a telephone, I got a busy signal, and it was going beep, 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 beep. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. I just let it keep, stay busy and just wrote it on the phone while I was listening to this busy signal, you know. <laughs> it's the loneliest number since the number one. I thought, uh, this, is, this is one of the great Nilsson songs. And later on, obviously, it became a huge hit. So, but not by Harry, unfortunately. But it still helped to build his credibility and that Nilsson mystique. He just came on the scene, you know, blasted onto the scene, and he just started influencing people. I'm sure he influenced the Beatles as much as the Beatles influenced him. Well, everybody's records influence all the minds, you know, at once. Everything influences everything. Nielsen's my favorite group. Dreams are nothing more than wishes, and a wish is just a dream. The Beatles endorsed Harry. They called him their favorite group. Harry was their, was their favorite group. <laughs> I think he was quite pleased about that. <laughs> They, uh, you know, pronounced him to the world and said, listen to this man, and we did. I remember that's one of the first times I've ever seen him kind of patting himself on the back and tooting his own, own horn. He said, you know, they, they think I'm like the fifth Beatle. I got a phone call, and it was from Derek Till, and uh, Derek said, hey, uh, the lads, the boys, the fabs, would uh, like you to come over and join them in the session. The recording at Abbey Road. I thought, my Jesus, this is about as good as it gets. <laughs> that first night in London, I spent at John Lennon's house. Uh, he gives me like a hug. <laughs> he smiled and he put me at ease instantly. So I, for some reason, I could say anything in front of this man and it would be okay. That night, we spent the entire night with a little uh, help from our friends. Uh, talking, just sitting and talking all night till dawn, till 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. And John and I on and on and on and on about marriage, life, death, divorce, women, what's it all about, you know, what are we doing? I think that Harry had an incredible respect for John. He was like a fan, you know. But, um, and John, John loved him too, so it was a good kind of combination, I think. He said that he and John were a lot alike, that they'd had similar childhoods, and um, I wasn't surprised by that, because I, you know, it was clear that John had a lot of anger. He didn't hide that. Harry hid it, but John didn't. So I thought that was very interesting. Harry, after he went over to England and was with the Beatles, or with John, and I, I really don't know which, he changed. He changed and became somebody else that I no longer knew. The willow weeps and having words can weep no more, but still it cries for me. It cries in sympathy. It knows that you are gone. Out of the blue, I got a telegram that said, I'm finding another producer. And basically, that was the end of Harry's and my relationship. And that's a pretty stunning statement to make. And I hesitated to say it, but facts are facts, and that's what happened. I never saw Harry again after that telegram. Never spoke to him, never saw him. Not out of malice from my point, we just never ran into each other or anything. I think if I, if I did, I would have said, what, what was that all about? 
Harry told me that for many years he thought his father had died in World War II, that his father was a CB in World War II. Then, in the late 1960s, Harry found out. He found out not only that his father was alive, but that he had remarried and had a family. When he was about 27 years old, he found out his father was living in Florida. He went to visit him. Um, you know, I think that must have been very hard on him. He didn't say a lot about it, you know. He didn't say that it was emotional. It was, you know. And I saw the picture of his dad, and they didn't even really look that much alike. So when I asked him about it, he just kind of like fluffed it off. He was like, "Yeah, it's interesting, you know," but uh, he didn't uh, extrapolate it on it, on it at all. So I think, and by what he didn't say, I felt that it, it was painful for him, you know. And he wasn't going to talk about it. He wouldn't go on about it at all. And I met him, and that was that. Where's that Joe Buck? Where's that Joe Buck? Where is that Joe Buck? Look at this crap! Yeah, where's that Joe Buck? You're due here at 4 o'clock. You know what you can do with them dishes. And if you ain't man enough to do it for yourself, I'd be happy to oblige. I really would. Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear what they're saying. Only the echoes of my mind. It was impossible not to be aware of Harry after Midnight Cowboy, because that song just went everywhere. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a big Nelson fan. I mean, ever since uh, Midnight Cowboy. I mean, how could I? <laughs> when, and then his most famous song, and he didn't write it. I love the irony of that, and he would appreciate that. I'm going while the sun keeps shining through the pouring rain. He was a brilliant interpreter, so he could take that Fred Neal song and make it his own. Everybody's Talking was not written for Midnight Cowboy. Everybody's Talking was Harry's single, and it had been out before the film. I was approached by Jerry Hellman and John Schlesinger and asked if I'd be interested in writing a song for Midnight Cowboy, a title song. They showed me four reels of uncut material, you know, and I thought, what? <laughs> this could be the best movie ever made, you know, this is incredible. You bet, you bet. He wrote, I guess the Lord must be in New York City. They also went to Bob Dylan, asked him to write a song. I understand that one was Lay, Lady, Lay that Dylan wrote, and they also went to Joni Mitchell and asked her to write a song. All of them wrote songs for the film and submitted it to the producers, and they listened to all the songs, and after hearing all this... They decided to stick with Everybody's Talking, which they had been using as a temporary track until they found a song for it. And they just got used to it, so used to it that they didn't want to drop it, and they left it in. Thank you very much. Midnight Cowboy won the Oscar for the best picture of the year. At the same time, Harry won the Grammy for the best contemporary vocal performance. Everybody's talking at me Yes. Hi. Um, I was going to ask you something. Well, why didn't you? When are you going to have a concert? Oh, I don't do concerts. That's for other people who don't want to do that. Oh. You're not going to have a concert ever? No. You know, many, many people are curious why Harry never performed live. Didn't make touring a part of his career. Didn't uh, go on the road and all of those issues. And there are many, many, many answers which are interesting and valid. 
He just couldn't do it. I don't know if it was um, fear of flying or fear of falling or, or I don't know what it was. Harry was uh, athletic, trim, cheerful, fun to be around. But Harry was the most insecure person I've ever known. He just didn't have any self-esteem. So I think that would have to have been part of the reason. He was quite shy, and I don't think he believed uh, that anyone would particularly want to see him on stage. He said, I just don't want to have to be on at 8 o'clock at night. And he was a lot like that. You, you know, he, he answered to no man, no man. He was terrified. And I, I don't remember exactly why, but he was terrified to do a live performance. And he'd mentioned that when he started, he was, he was uh, in the late 50s, and he was doing a, a thing, with a, a, a duo with another guy, uh, Everly Brothers songs. And um, they got up to perform, and they were nervous. He was nervous. And for whatever reason, it was horrible. It didn't work. And I laughed and uh, kind of really scarred him. That probably was one of those things where he didn't want to get burned twice. If the way to become a rock star was to make an album and then go and promote the album and then go out on tour, Harry figured, I'm gonna do it another way. I'm gonna find a way to do it. You don't have to go on tour. And he, part of it was about just proving that you didn't have to do it. There are very few guys that have had the success that he had without doing that. And he, he, he almost pulled it off. Well, he did pull it off. We're sitting here doing this, this documentary. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> when he was young, he sang in the band and his fans all looked the same. And the fans he had were younger than he and he loved to scream his name. They'll leave at the end of the third show, go home. Talk of the fun. Well, isn't it nice? The parents would say, Well, isn't it nice? You got someone, someone to idolize. He must look twice his size. I think it's great you're going through a phase. Harry was offered a BBC special to be produced by Stanley Dorfman, who was doing the In Concert series, and In Concert means In Concert. That means there would be an audience. But Harry didn't do audiences. And I said he could do anything he wanted. This is not this is BBC, it's not like American television. You literally can have the freedom of the studio. Once he realized he could come and play, have more or less control of what he wanted to do, he said, yeah, why not? <laughs> to a studio and made it uh, one afternoon we made up a show with Harry um, at the piano uh, he'd do a song and say well what should we do now then we he said well let's do three Harry's come on baby let the good times roll It was extremely creative from Harry's point of view because he was having fun and it's the only way he would do television. Thank you, listener. Now enjoy some Randy Newman. It's so hard 
actually reached over and grabbed my wrist and he said, I want you to hear something. And I went, wow, well, I'm gonna hear some, I'm gonna hear some Harry Nelson. And he took me and started playing endless, endless Randy Newman songs. I mean, he was so enamored with Randy Newman and that's all he would talk about. Listen to this, listen to this. He loved to do things differently. He just couldn't go in and do the same thing over and over again. That would have been very safe, um, very easy but it wouldn't have satisfied him. The notion of Harry doing a whole album of Randy Newman is, is I, I'm sure, unnerving to the people at the label who are waiting for the whole, the new uh, Harry album with all of his new songs. So he took some turns that were obviously Harry turns, not, uh, you know, career-oriented. Having said that, there was no better consistently great composer at that time than Randy Newman. I think he was just writing immense stuff, and Harry realized that and uh, wanted to be the guy to showcase. He was unlike uh, most other writers that I knew in that, in that he, had, uh, uh, he had an open mind and he was generous with praise and really enthusiastic about stuff that he liked. So pretty big honor for me, I mean, you know, milestone in my life in some ways. Okay, that's enough for Andy Newman. Uh, tonight, let's see, I think I'll tell stories about marriage. Life is really easy when two are divided, one has decided to bring down the curtain, in one thing for certain there's nothing to keep them together. Most people don't know it, but in 1964, Harry got married for the first time. The marriage didn't last very long, and there were no children of the marriage. Her name was Sandy. And I said, what was that like? He says, I just did that to get out of the water. And now, he obviously, you know, I mean, she was a nice girl. She had a son, and, you know, I don't know what happened, but he, but that's how he would, you know, I just married again on board, you know? <laughs> so I guess that was another painful thing. He would, you know, he just had a way of doing that. You know, if it was painful to him, or if he didn't want to talk about it, he would just, he would have these one-liners that would dismiss it. Subject closed. Love was started as easy to measure each day was a pleasure each night an adventure each morning was something that had to be shared together. Love was growing as full of surprises as temperature rises from high to high and the turns of the fire and it has to be shared together. Harry got married for a second time New Year's Eve of 1969 in Vegas when he married Diane. And Harry and Diane did have a child, a child uh, named Zach. Zachary Nine, N-I-N-E, Nilsson. Little fella, you're so tired, you can hardly lift your head. But you want to hear a story before you go to bed. So if you'll be quiet and listen patiently, I'll sing you a song that my mother sang to me. And he was absolutely thrilled. It was great. And he was just, he was just, you know, he was just a typical new father. He was, you know, he's got a boy. And, you know, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to see him enjoy that, have that in his life. My dad wrote this thing on a piece of paper for when, when I was a baby. He, it was just a note to me. Um, even though I couldn't read or and I wasn't old enough to understand it or anything, he wrote this note which basically told me how much he loved me. And reading it now, uh, it just makes me realize that he really did. Dear Zach, I stood over you and watched you sleep for 30 minutes this morning. Someday you will know how I feel as I write these words. You are beautiful. You moved your toes and feet proportionally to the noise I made. You were on top of your blanket, an orange blanket with yellow daisies, and your pacifier was an inch from your mouth. It had obviously been released with sleep. I love you, Big Daddy Schmilson. So, you know, to write something like that, obviously there's something there. 
I don't think Harry was ready to be a father. I think he liked the idea. But the reality of parenting was just too much for him. He didn't, he didn't have the time or the capacity to do that. And he just mostly was absent. Part of him wanted to be a parent, part of him wanted to be a partner and married, but most of him didn't want to be. You know, he wanted to be out carousing with his buddies, drinking tequila every night. He didn't want to be in a relationship. We were riding back together from New York on a train out to the island, you know, and he, he very solemnly said, you know, we're, we're, we're breaking up, you know. And I said, oh, Jesus, Skeeter. And he says, yeah. And, you know, I said, what happened, you know? He said, uh, he said, we just tried very hard to love each other. That's all he said. There's, there's the, the 1941 thing almost mirrored his own life, and it, it's, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not how he intended it to be, <laughs> uh, but it did. You know, in 1941, a happy father had a son. 1944, his father walked right out the door, and that's almost exactly what happened, except in the 70s. <laughs> Now you tell me, is this a story or is this a story? Yeah, Dad, sure. It's an okay story. It's sort of... Okay? Are you kidding me? Just okay? Come on, it's more than... Oh, it's good. I like the kid, Oblio, and his dog. I think he's a great-looking dog. Great-looking? Oh, sure. I get it. Youth, imagination, the view from the mind's eye. You've got a creative little head on your shoulders there, son. Harry was an idea man, see? He was an idea man. He was had just... Everything was... was uh, an immediate... I mean, you know, absolute mer mercury. Me and my arrow Straighter than now It's just an idea I had one night. I, just, I think it was on some kind of weirdness. The more you walk around thinking about the idea, the more permutations grow out of it, you know? I just realized it was the world's longest pun, and then I realized, God, point of sale, hmm, point of view, point of wall, you know, and all those things. The point is one of those examples that you, it just shows you that Harry is, is unique unto himself. Here was an incredible concept that he made into a musical at a time when musicals couldn't have been more off the charts. He wrote all the songs for that, and it's a great children's animation. Very, it's like one of the first children's animations I saw that was very kind of lyrical and very funny and in a weird way kind of dark, but you know, great songs. This is the town and these are the people. This is the town where the people all stay. This is the town and these are the people. That's the way they wanted it. That's the way it's going to stay. Mostly it was philosophical in attitude. Everybody had a point, a philosophical point, a point of this, a point of that. In fact, even the people were pointed people, pointed clocks, pointed cars, pointed this, houses, etc. And um, this little kid was born into the society with a round head. And so how he's ostracized and kicked out and beat up and all. But the kid proves he has a point without having a point. And Harry loved those philosophical turns and twists. He has a point there! <laughs> Called me up one morning, said I got to come over and talk to you. So he came over to my house in Laurel Canyon, and um, he's, he asked me if I'd like to produce him. I said I would love to, under one condition, that he had to trust me and let me call the shots, which he agreed to. One more, put it away. Put it away. Let's nail this mother to the wall. Richard's a great producer, really talented guy, and and again, a tough guy in his own way. But you needed a tough guy to deal with Harry. You couldn't, Harry could run over people. 
and and a lot of people he did run over, and so he needed a counterweight, and and Richard was that. Harry, don't smoke those. <laughs> well, come on, man. I home yesterday, you know? When you walked into the studio, Richard was in charge, and it was wonderful. You know, there's like several good takes, and it's the kind of thing where if there's a great second verse, it can be used as the first verse of, uh, you know. He had the brightness to handpick musicians and then allow them to feel at least they were free. But it, you were always being wonderfully, gently maneuvered by Richard, you see. And then there was Harry, who also you know, knew exactly what he wanted. I felt that Harry could be my Beatles, and he in turn, I suppose, felt that I could be his George Martin, which I think we did a pretty good job of accomplishing on the Nielsen Schmilson album. That was the goal, to make as close to a Beatles quality album as possible. The first song we did was Gotta Get Up, which is the first song on the album. And like right from that opening, the way the piano starts, you could sense that this was gonna be something special. In some ways, he could be completely normal, and other times he could be totally eccentric. So, um, when, you know, once you knew how to roll with the punches, it kind of made life interesting in the studio. Brother bought a coconut, he bought it for a diamond. Sister had another one, she paid it for the lime. She put the lime in the coconut, she dragged them both up, she put the lime in the coconut. He played it for me the first time on guitar, and he, he just sang it, and it was just like straight through, no, no changes at all. Put the lime in the coconut, you drink them both up. Put the lime in the coconut, you drink them both up. Put a lime in the coconut, and drink them both together. Put the lime in the coconut, then you feel better. I thought to myself, this song really has the potential to be like a little animated cartoon. There's like at least three different characters in the song that I can think of. So I said, why don't you try using different voices? Think of the doctor saying, now let me get this straight. You put the lime in the coconut. Now let me get this straight. Put the lime in the coconut. He responded to it immediately. And, um, and then you get this, this marvelous theatrical performance that has made the song a classic. About halfway through the album, we had a difference of opinion that didn't sort of settle itself easily. So like two proper gentlemen, we decided to um, have a meeting over high tea at the Dorchester Hotel to discuss what we were gonna do. I said, Harry, you do remember that when you came to me and asked me to produce you, I asked you, uh, my only condition was that I would have control creative control. He looks me dead in the face and said, well, I lied. <laughs> and then with that, we both looked at our watch and realized that we were late for the session, that he was supposed to do his vocal on Without You. Without another word, we jumped into a taxi, ran down to the studio, he went right out and sang the vocal that you hear on the record. No, I can't forget this evening Or your face as you were leaving But I guess that's just the way the story goes you That was an extraordinary day. I mean, because also when, when Harry would go for the high notes, it was like a trapeze artist. You know, you knew he could fall and he kept you on the edge of your seat and then he would be there. Hey, 
it, it's like one of those anthemic things that people say, I live with living this without you. It's a great, great performance. Just a great all time nail that song. We weren't thinking, oh, Grammy, here we come, but we're thinking it'd be nice. And while we were in Japan, the nominations had come out and uh, album of the year, record of the year, best male vocal performance, best engineered record. Uh, I mean, whatever category it could have been nominated, it was nominated. He was thrilled. All of his dreams had come true. You know, he wanted to have a huge success. He had it. After the Nielsen Schmielsen album, I think he was arguably the finest white male singer on the planet. Nielsen Schmielsen is a masterpiece, and he was pretty crazy, but Richard had some control over the situation, and that album came out beautifully. And it, it was really post Nielsen Schmielsen that the troubles set in because he didn't want Richard Perry in there. He didn't want anybody telling him what to do. He was going through a bad period in life and, and rather than using that to, uh, uh, you know, in a way inspire him or, 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 or trying to be creative with your pain, he just let it start the downward spiral that ultimately destroyed him. I don't think Harry handled success well. I think that the more successful he became, the more he drank. He didn't really feel that he deserved the applaud and the accreditation that he was getting, and became an alcoholic, really, just a sort of retreat, as a sort of hideaway from that. That was a difficulty, and he knew his mom had the drinking problem. Runs in the family, our grandfather drank, Charlie Martin, you know, and his mother did, runs in the family. And my mother told him, you watch it, you watch it, this runs in our family. And he said, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It was frustrating because I, I didn't have enough of a power, a power in the relationship to say stop, you know, but I wish I had. I don't think Harry expected to live very long. Both his parents died in their 50s, so you know, that somehow becomes a factor in how people look at life. I think that it's really hard to say that you're a bright man and um, just to drink that much or to smoke that much and not address that you're being self-destructive. It was one of those things where he just went like 500 miles an hour until he stopped, <laughs> you know? Whereas most people just kind of cruise and speed up and slow down and speed up and then you, go, and then you kind of peter off and eventually you park. <laughs> But he was just I'm going down. Long ago, far away. Excuse me. <laughs> it's an artist's prerogative to be indulgent to himself. He owes it to everyone else to be indulgent to himself. And if it's at the cost of what he thinks is what the public might think it might result in, that's tough luck. We were best pals. You know, we hung out together all the time. We traveled together. We had a blast. We partied together. I mean, there wasn't anything we didn't do together. And work together. And I, I was looking at a lifetime of hits. You know, I mean, you know, with the different things that he could do with his voice, I mean, just when you, I, I mean, there was no, no limitation as to what, you know, we were capable of. I mean, Nielsen Schmielsen was like the warm up. But the second one was Son of Schmielsen, and I think the cracks had already started to appear by that time. He had just separated and was going through a divorce with his first wife, Diane and it hit him really hard. He nurtured it like a serpent to his breast. He hated it. I'm sure he took it as if he was a good Catholic boy, which I think he essentially was. Uh, he um, 
took it as a failure that he ended uh, in a divorce. And it shows in his material, the songs that he would sing. You're breaking my heart, you're tearing it apart, so fuck you. Having a single was and still is the greatest promotional vehicle for selling an album. And when you're more than capable of churning out material that had best commercial potential and at the same time was loaded with artistic integrity, what does he come up with as the strongest single possibility? You're breaking my heart, you're tearing it apart, I won't give you the punchline, you know the song. Everybody knows the word. It's hypocrisy at its greatest, uh, and it's such a great way to send it up, you know? You're breaking my heart, so f you, you know? And what do you say? You're breaking my heart, darn it? That's what he offered as the best, you know? I mean, that, that was his, 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 his love song to his ex-wife. He would show up to the studio with a half a bottle of cognac. The first half had already been consumed that afternoon. He would no longer allow my input into the songs. I mean, he would just like come up with a song and I'd say, well, can we talk about this? No, that's the song, that's the vocal. And that's why you've got an album that still has, has some lovely moments in it, but I mean, there's no real uh, depth or stature to it uh, anywhere near what uh, the Schmilson album was, and I was expecting it to be the next level. Oh, I'd rather be dead. I'd rather be dead. I'd rather be dead. Then wet my bed. I did everything I could as, as you know, more as his friend than anything, trying to explain to him why you're doing this. You know, it could be so much better than w what we're doing. Then wet my bed. It just, you know, he was determined to do things the way he wanted to on that album. Oh, rather be alive. But when the dream comes true, you're better off dead. It could happen to you when you and you all around me. it was um, important for his career that he does an album of standards. Now, I love standards, and I knew that he could perform them magnificently. But I said, now is not the time. What you really need in your career is to recapture, truly recapture, where we left off with Nielsen Schmielsen to just write the best songs of your career and, and we really like roll up our sleeves and just make a killer record. No, I, I, I have to do this standards album. I said, well, good luck.
I never stopped loving the guy, and he me. I know that for a fact. And so, uh, you know, what's missing here? You know, why is this such a sad ending to a, what could be a tremendous story? And it's because, in my way of interpreting it, Harry, at that point in his life, developed a death wish. And um, he was successful. It took him 20 years, but he carried it out. I figured my voice was probably at its purest and best at that moment. Even though I was smoking and drinking and doing all the nastiness, I figured this is the time to really capture my voice on tape. The bells are ringing for me and my gal. The birds are singing for me and my gal. He got Derek Taylor to produce the album, got Gordon Jenkins, who had been Frank Sinatra's arranger, to arrange it, and for the orchestra, they got the London Philharmonic. And they went into the studio and recorded these wonderful songs as only Harry could perform them. I think of all the work that he did, he loved that album more than anything else that he did, because those tunes meant a lot to him, and he could sing them. If you listen to a little touch of Schmielsen in the night, and you listen to the way he sung those standards, long before this current lemming-like rush of pop artists for the standard repertoire, Harry was singing those songs and singing them with great class and great dignity and singing them, singing them on a level with a Sinatra in his own way. That was the one of the greatest make-out albums ever made. Still, probably still works, too. Woman needs man, and man must have his name. That no one can deny. It's still the same old story. If you were in a jam at 3 o'clock in the morning and there was one person that you could call for help, mm. who would it be? In America, it's like Harry Nielsen. I think I could always call Harry night and day and he would come and save you. I'm very lucky with friends like that. People, let me tell you about my best friend. He's a warm-hearted person who loved me till the end. People let me tell you about my best friend He's a one boy, cuddly toy My up, my down, my pride and joy People let me tell you about him He's so much fun Whether we're talking man to man Or whether we're talking son to son Cause he's my best friend I think that Harry's friendship with John was also very, very close. But I, I don't think it was as intimate as his relationship with Ringo Starr. When Ringo Starr would give Harry Nilsson a present for Christmas, then Harry Nilsson's present for Ringo Starr's Christmas was twice as big. I mean, they just kind of like, it was obscene. They loved hanging out. They loved being together. And they just loved, and they, they also, you know, they, there was a time when everybody was getting crazy. They loved getting crazy together, you know? They could just go on and on and on. And the two of them were like an act, you know? They were kind of Laura Hardy. 
we went to Ringo's house once and they had a password. And uh, Harry would say the password at the gate. It was something really strange and I don't remember what it was. But Ringo knew who it was and let him in, you know? <laughs> it was that sort of thing. It's like the secret password for the clubhouse. I know it's impossible. The netherworld expects to crown me king. But I would give anything to be mortal. It's not impossible for you to be made human. Ringo was, was the producer and star, or co-star, of this rock and roll Dracula movie. Probably one of the worst movies ever made. It's been, it was a great line. Some movies are released, others escape. <laughs> this one, this one escaped. Here come the daylight, it's making me sad. Here come the sunlight, making me sad. Had a good time last night, best I ever had. Here come the sunshine, it's making me sad. So sad, so sad, so sad, so sad. I don't even remember if anybody directed it or not, if, if they directed it. And, you know, again, it was this situation where there was no, really nobody kind of driving the train anymore. Everybody was in the in the cars <laughs> partying. Had a good time last night, just me and my friends. But here come the daylight, and now it's the end. Of Ringo and Harry were very good friends, and they had fun together. They knew how to go out and have fun. I was associated then with the drinking and carousing and because I think Keith Moon's a friend and Ringo's a friend and we always and we have good times people can assume you're raising hell if you're having a good time but I promise you folks we don't raise hell but we do have a good time and Harry didn't stop at alcohol <laughs> and there, was a, there were dealers all over the city heading for Harry I think helping him to spend his advances <laughs> and you know Harry was like he was going the full ball the full like rock and roll life you can Harry would come around and trouble <laughs> would follow very shortly. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, well, I got that call many times. I got the call from Harry, what are you doing? That was, the call was a very bad thing. I always knew that when Harry called, <laughs> I had to like, okay, what am I doing? Okay, and I'm ready to take the Harry trip, you know, get on the Harry ride, you know, <laughs> because it's like a ride where you have no idea where it's gonna go, it's not on tracks. Harry was a wonderful perpetrator, uh, an argent provocateur of these things. It was lunch on a Tuesday at like Martoni Marquis. Three days later, I woke up in a massage parlor in Phoenix, <laughs> you know, and I was like, what? Some of those Harry tales, I'll have to be like shock therapy to remember. <laughs> you know, oh, remember that? Ah! Woo! No, I mean, they're probably out there. They're probably lodged somewhere in the cortex, but it'll take, you know, you know, well, probably years from now, I'll go, did I really? Yeah. A weed whacker? It was fun because it's just you never knew when you were going to be coming home, you know, when you, when you left the house. You know, that was the kind of a downside. You'd say, hi, honey, I'm going out with Harry. And, and uh, you know, and my wife would go, oh, no. When are you coming home? That was the first thing she would say. Oh, Lord! What is it? I'm full of it. Good. Tonight. Right. Well, I had my share of bad times. I've been shooting them up, drinking them down, taking them pills, moving around all my life. John was one of a kind. I mean, there was just no one like him. He was tough as nails. He just... Uh, fearless and just said what he felt. You know? and that's something that he was always ahead. He was always a couple of steps ahead of you. I was just sort of hanging around with Harry and Nielsen and people in LA and just getting into trouble. And every time we go out for the night, I end up in the paper. <laughs> I don't know when that happened. It just sort of happened that uh, Raising Hell with Harry became the uh, catchphrase of the month. If he wants to go out to have a drink, it's party time. He'll start it. You'll get in trouble and he'll walk away scot free, but he started it. <laughs> We're making our big comeback and. and uh... 
at the Troubadour here in, uh, in Hollywood. And major opening. I mean, the, the stars were out to see the Smothers Brothers. And I was counting on this as a big comeback. The Troubadour, all the people were invited. The Smothers Brothers have been assassinated from television. And here they are. They applauded like crazy. We walk on. And we start working. And there's Harry. Harry comes in with uh, John Lennon. And he told John Lennon, he said, you know, Tommy's uh, he's not very good. You know, heckling helps him. So these guys came in coked up and really uh, cognac, and every single moment there was a silence. There would be the most disgusting, I mean, really the worst heckling in the world. The Smothers Brothers were, of course, astounded and blindsided and all of that. And uh, Harry and John were going to help the show along and become part of the show. That's what their idea was. Four or five sheets to the wind. I got drunk and shouted. You know, uh, it was the first night I drank Brandy Alexander's, which is brandy and milk, folks. And I was with Harry Nielsen, who didn't quite get as much coverage as me, the bum. <laughs> and he really encouraged me. You know, there was, I usually have somebody there that says, OK, Lennon, shut up. And I take it, you know. But I didn't have anybody around me to say, shut up. And I just went on and on. Harry's got, come on, let's say it some more. And I turned around and I looked at Harry and said, please stop. And he goes, no, no, the audience loves us. I said, no, they don't. I was really pissed at him. Totally pissed at him. Well, Dick and I have a very tight act with great spaces in for timing, and every one of them was wrecked. And next thing you know, the manager came over and grabbed John by the collar. And all of a sudden, John went back to his little teddy boy days and says, wait a minute, you don't pull me in. The next thing you know, the table went flying. Fists were flying, and people were stumbling around, and people were, shut up, oh, fuck you, you know, there was this constant thing. And thrown out. And finally, they were thrown out. It was just a, a disaster. When it's Errol Flynn, you know, all them showbiz writers say, those were the days when we had Sinatra and Errol Flynn socking it to the people, you know, those are the real men. I do it and I'm a bum. So I, it was a mistake, but hell, you know, well, I'm human, you know. Hi, you pussycat. You say you open up a bicycle wash and the first six customers drown. And they pick you up in the wax museum for trying to score with Marie Antoinette. Is that what's got you down, pussycat? Well, rise up. Get yourself Harry Nielsen's new album, Pussycats, produced by John Lennon, Nielsen's latest Pussycats, on RCA records and tapes. Meow and purr. Some tracks are beautiful, some tracks are a bit weird, but uh, Harry Nielsen and John Lennon together is a pretty weird combination. To have John was like giving Harry the best present he could have. That almost made up for the fact that his father left him. And, you know, there may be some of you out there saying, yeah, Webb's being the amateur psychiatrist now. But I think that that almost made up for it because Harry really wanted to be one of the Beatles. Well, the relationship with John was like if you see the album, Pussycats, have you ever seen the cover? You know, <laughs> they were like in each other's face. This was like, a, it was like a duel. They were a friendship made in hell as far as I'm concerned. John had his troubles, Harry had his troubles, and they got together and really, that was, that was when Harry totally blew his voice. and John Lennon were egging each other on as to who could scream the loudest and scream the longest and put the most ragged, actually self-destructive vocals on tape as possible. It was this one-upmanship, friendly kind of thing, but like, you know, I can do anything, you can do better, no, you can't, yes, I can, no, you can't, yes, I can, no, you can't. I believe it was purposeful. Not consciously, but I believe that he was, he was, I can't believe I'm getting into all of this, first of all. I, I, I really, I think he was, he was, some very bizarre reason, trying to self-destruct. He told me 
one time that there was blood on the microphone. Harry told me. He said there was blood on the microphone. I drove him to the hospital and he had the throat thing and the polyps and all that stuff. And he called me up and he says, get me out of here. Bring me a bottle of brandy and a pack of cigarettes <laughs> into the hospital. And I said, not the cigarettes. <laughs> uh, but I brought a bottle of brandy and he walked out in the green robe. Just couldn't be bothered. You know, I, I never sensed any kind of, it's not really happening kind of denial. It was just, ah, oh, fuck it, give me a cigarette. It was his kind of attitude about everything. I was horrified. Um, first of all, I wanted to know if he was okay. Um, I was horrified because this very beautiful instrument which he had, um, you, you held your breath for suddenly because you know, what happens now? Will it ever be the same? That was the saddest thing that ever happened to me in my life, was when I realized that he, that he, that he was in that much trouble vocally, and that he didn't know how to tell me, and that he didn't want anyone to know. And it's just hard for me to talk about it. I just can't talk about it. Met in the most magical way. I used to ask for them for my mom to tell me the story again and again. My mom, who was born in Ireland, she was born in Dublin actually, was on a exchange program, a work exchange program. So she was living abroad in New York. She was 19 and you know, new to America. This sweet Catholic school Irish girl. A girlfriend and I were working for the summer. We were students and we were working for the summer at Rumpelmeyer's Ice Cream Parlor. And one evening, it was a rather quiet evening, and both of us were sort of leaning up against the wall, and in walked Harry. Sunday night, half drunk, flask of brandy, one pocket, copy of US News in the other. And as I walked to my hotel, I noticed Rumpelmeyer's Ice Cream Parlor. And there was Una. Basically, the first thing Harry ever said to me was, you have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. Will you marry me? Obviously, no one had ever said anything like that to me before, but it was very special. And uh, he said, no, no, really. He said, what can I do to prove my intent? And we said, oh, well, we like flowers and we like melons. Now, you might think that's a very odd thing to say, but perhaps I'd never really, well, I'd never eaten a honeydew melon. <laughs> right, went to my hotel, showered, sobered, changed. The melons were easy, smile was delicatessen, but the flowers, that's another question. 11 p.m. on a Sunday night, August 12th, 1973, flowers at 11 p.m. Hey, what about the docks? Right. So we actually found a florist. He was preparing for a funeral the next morning. At the end of the evening, when my friend and I were getting ready to leave, the manager came over and he said, there is a man waiting for, for you outside the kitchen. <laughs> and we were very excited and we went outside and there was Harry leaning nonchalantly against a long limousine. And on the pavement beside him, he had baskets of um, uh, flowers and melons and soft toys. They were totally knocked out. They hugged me and they hugged me it was the sweetest hug I'd ever had. And I feel like it's gonna get a whole lot better. Better than the night before the night I met her. Feel like it's gonna get a whole lot better. Better than the night before the night I met her. Whoa, whoa. 
the day of the wedding, it was like hell day hangover. The limo showed up. Ringo gave me a toot for luck. The limo driver gave me a gram for luck. And even the father, the priest, a priest of the Church of God knows what, shared another gram. Now I was shaking so much I could barely stand. But I said, to hell with it. You only married thrice. The wedding ceremony. <laughs> Ooh. We were married in, it was really a suite at the Marriott Hotel. The wedding was organized very, very quickly. Van Dyke Parks brought a priest. Somebody else brought flowers and somebody else so hard, an accordionist. Ringo Starr was our best man and he was <laughs> so funny. He went to um, Tiffany's and uh, took a tray of rings because he, did, we didn't, he didn't know our sizes and he sort of held his tray of rings out for us to choose. In two tries, he found the right sizes. Then it was my turn to place the beautiful golden circles on the love of my life. Ringo said, oh, look, he's shaking. And he helped me steady my hands with Una and slip on the ring. It was perfect. In 1974, Harry renegotiated his record deal with RCA Records, and at that time got what I understand to be one of the biggest advances in the history of the record business. P.S. He did it with the help of John Lennon. It was John and I with Harry, and we wa um, marched into the president of uh, RCA at that time. And Harry says, do you know Look who's in your office. It's John Lennon in this piece of shit record company's office. John Lennon is here. And, and John says, do you know who stand is this Harry Nilsson, the greatest rock and roll thing, and you're fucking him over? There's John giving a speech saying, you're going to lose one of the greatest voices of all time. You got to re-sign this man. You got to give him a record deal. You got to, do, I mean, John was just going right for it. He didn't care. He believed in Harry that much. The so contracts that had sat there unsigned by them for over a year, he signed and sent them and Harry got his deal. <laughs> Okay. Harry would go into a session with a sheet of paper and 15 musicians and just one sheet of paper that he has, you know, and we would start, you know, to us. I mean, I'm sure that he had it worked out in his brain, but when it got to us, it was ideas. Right. get to a certain point and you think, you know, either you know, I, I can do this myself or I'm the only one that can do this and nobody else understands me and nobody else can, can see this, nobody else has the vision. God's not even with us, he said that God is really dead. He said, oh pal, facts are fact, you can't believe that magic act. I said I don't, and that was that. Harry had a full bar set up in the studio with I mean everything from corned beef bagels and and bottles of booze any drink you could possibly want Chris could I have some scotch some water some matches and some heroin please <laughs> there, there would be a lot of people around and it would be full-on drug culture Harry, where's the shit? And there would be a sort of a half-hearted attempt at making a record going on. 
and a lot of confusion. The line between, you know, day and night and work and play, uh, it just disappeared entirely. It, it was, of course it was fun. We were all in the bag and laughing and carrying on, but it certainly was a silly way to make records. Okay, all right. That's certainly worth listening. Let's go in. This ran out of 10 minutes. It was a very difficult time for him. RCA was unhappy, um, obviously, and he was unhappy. You know, he was blaming them that they didn't know how to deal with his product. And, you know, and they were blaming him about the albums they were making. And it got really uncomfortable, and they offered him money to buy him out. It was a lot of money. I remember the day that Harry came over and said, hey, he was laughing. He was saying, RCA Victor just gave me $3 million. I'm going to retire. I'm buying apartment buildings. I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And he was bragging about it and pretending to be happy about it. But the truth was, he was distraught because they had paid him off. They had paid him off. They, they wanted to get out from under the deal. He, I think he knew that, um, you know, that his voice wasn't the same. It was, I think the, I think the rejection the failures were really hard on him, you know. It was just, it was kind of, he felt like a has-been in a lot of ways. And so he turned his attention in other directions. This was a, a wonderful opportunity that Harry grabbed. We all grabbed. And Harry, the score writer, was, was wonderful. Um, writing all these wonderful songs and with Van Dyke Parts to be his orchestrator and co-writer. Uh, for this wonderful movie, Popeye, with Robin Williams. I think it's Robin's first film, actually. Big connection in Popeye. Being in Malta, big connection. Uh, both, it's almost like being a veteran, surviving Popeye. Altman thought it was a good idea to take all the musicians to Malta, which is a crazy idea, because they just, you know, they just took all the drugs in the Middle East with them, you know, and it became to have this huge party. People were lucky to get out alive. In the morning air, there's a mustard bell, blow me down. I think the first song you've ever played for was Blow Me Down, you know. And that was, so this is interesting. Blow me down. When you're talking like that, how do, how do you go? You know, it's like that, blow me down. And it's that, he would work with it to try and, you know, give it a range. You know, that would still be a character. And that's what I, that's what I remember of it, you know, him trying to tweak it around the character, but still writing the songs. I what I am, I do it for me. Believe it or not, it's a lovely day. It's a perfect day. Blow me down. Within the song are these wonderful references, and I can't, I don't, obviously, it's so wonderful I've forgotten them, but that's appropriate, isn't it? We're talking Harry now in those times. That it was like, um, it was just, it's very beautiful. And I mean, a lot of that soundtrack is very elegant. John Lennon was killed last night. The former Beatle, 40 years old, was shot to death as he and his wife, Yoko Ono, were walking through the great arched entryway of the Dakota, the landmark apartment building where they lived in New York. I was with Harry on the night that John was shot. And he was in the studio. It was that Monday night because we were all watching the football game. And all of a sudden, the, the flash came on the screen that said John Lennon had been shot. And we all freaked. And it was like, what? You know, and everything just stopped for a minute. People just looked at each other and shook their heads. And I went in the bathroom and just put a wet towel on my face and just said, Jesus Christ, not him. It devastated him. Because I don't think that Harry felt that they'd had their last conversation. Well, it was so severe that we didn't talk about it. 
between us. I don't think he ever really dealt with it. And right after that, he went into major gun control. He started throwing parties. We'd all go to his house, and he had the little button with the gun with the X through it. And, and he started doing that. And it was all for John. But I really sort of think it was sort of a ghost that stayed with him forever. My name is Harry Nielsen, and I'm uh, national chairman of the End Handgun Violence Week, which takes place between October 25th and October 31st. Uh, if you'd like to help us end handgun violence, please write to 100 Maryland Avenue, Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20002. Too bad we have so many people dying every year from handgun violence. Thank you. The whole focus of his being seemed to be about trying to get gun control laws. And Harry, who was a very private person and was rarely seen in public, went public with this. He went on television talking about the importance of handgun control. He formed an organization for handgun control. He went to Washington and lobbied with lawmakers over handgun control, not caring about the cost to his career. He'd given up songwriting and you know, it's like Cezanne giving up painting. You can't do that. Once you're a creator, you have to keep creating. I always really believed, along with the other people, that Harry maybe wasn't choosing his battles wisely. You know, that he should more been more interested in entertaining Harry the entertainer, Harry the raconteur, Harry the melodian, instead of Harry the concerned citizen fighting tooth and nail to get a political lobby for gun control. He was caring about the society itself, too, you know, so I think that was um, a stronger emotion in him than regretting what he became or what he, he didn't become. Um, ultimately, you might say it was um, a disappointment, really, because I don't think our laws have changed a lot in terms of the dangers we're exposed to. You know the old cliché, and most clichés are clichés because they're true. Behind every great man is a great woman. He was totally in love with Una, and it was very touching, extremely touching. You know, I know he was married twice before, and I don't, I don't even know their names. I know nothing about that. You know, like the, it seemed like, you know, when he found her, that was it. Lean on me, lean on me. I found uh, some sort of poem he wrote her in which he said, there have been, of all the great loves that existed in history, and he listed off a bunch of couples, maybe um, Romeo and Juliet, and he said, Yoko and John, Harry and Una. <laughs> and Una had such a calm aura about her. She just, whatever he was doing, crashing, bang, or anything, she just was there. It's nice when somebody actually finds the ballast in their life, and I think Harry found it with Una. She was the anchor, yeah, good old mom. And the other weird part about Harry, as outrageous as he was, he loved his children and all these kids, and he was very much about that. When any of the children would walk into the room, he was just, he would light up. They were climbing all over him. They were on his back, they were on his head. They were uh, adored, cherished, treasured, pampered, uh, given every uh, luxury imaginable and every latitude in terms of their behavior and the way, I mean, he was absolutely one of the most doting, loving dads I've ever seen. He was really hands-on, being careful, being caring, and um, all, always talking about Una and his children. They were everything to him, Una and the kids. It was kind of contradictory looking because he was out a lot. And he wasn't typical, certainly not the 
be home to see your wife, honey, you know? That didn't happen in that regard, but it was all about them. And without them, I would shudder to think what would have happened. I, I couldn't possibly think. There's nothing left to say. I'll pack up my memories, then I'll walk away. A lot of things went domino at the end there. Very bad uh, series of circumstances, including the threat of bankruptcy and lawsuits that might come from it. Once again, back where he began. In the early 90s, his business manager, who was his accountant, who he had trusted implicitly and who had control over all of his money, embezzled virtually all of his money. His financial world, which he was so proud of for his children and for his family, all fell apart. Uh, and uh, that was a cruel trick. And, uh, and that's what broke my heart for him, you know. He, uh, that shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened to anybody. It shouldn't have happened to him. He got very caught up in trying to you know, sell the house, trying to get money. He was selling off his library of music. It was a point that really made me sad, because he had all these CDs that he was going around to ad agencies, trying to sell his songs for commercials to get some money. It was um, an incredible blow to him. And I don't think he ever recovered. A man wants to be a success. He wants to be a good provider. And the things that he had worked for uh, were gone. So it was really, really hard. The last thing he recorded that was ever released was uh, I Love New York in June. How about you? For Fisher King. I like New York in June. How about you? It's a beautiful story. Like well written and, uh, and wonderfully directed by Terry, beautifully shot, etc. Harry had to be in this mix. Romanticism, lyricism. Tunes, melody, had to be there, had to be there. Those heartstrings had to be pulled. It was back in 1991, I'd gotten a, a, a call from Harry saying he was going to London to do The Fisher King. And uh, I asked him if I could go along with him. I don't think he was expecting that, <laughs> but uh, he said yes. It was a magical, magical day. And uh, with Harry um, physically struggling, you know. His voice had gone by then. I mean, it was, it was but it was still quite wonderful because he, he, he could always work it. It was just, just his great instrument, and uh, even his whistle was gone by. <laughs> we still, he still whistled in the thing. As soon as he sat down on his stool in the booth, with his headphones on, it was young Harry. He was like his oldest son, you know, or his youngest son, all wrapped up in one. It was just beautiful. And the voice was absolutely appropriate for the piece. That would turn out to be not only the first, but the last time that we'd spend a significant amount of time together, just the two of us. I remember on the last night before I had to leave, we agreed to stay up all night in the hotel room, talking about whatever, and we did. Around four in the morning, he got too tired, and he had to, he had to go to sleep, so I left after that, but that's a good memory for me. I like it, how about you? I never saw a nobler human being than Harry Nielsen in the final couple of years of his life. He was as happy and as brave and as confident as any man I've ever seen. As ill as he was, he pulled his family out of bankruptcy. He pulled himself together. He faced what he was facing with as much good humor as you could possibly imagine. This was 1990. Three, when my dad had a heart attack, he'd felt these chest pains. 
tried to ignore it like it was nothing. And then he goes to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you've had this major heart attack. What are you doing not calling an ambulance? After that first heart attack, I called him and he said, I've had hangovers that were worse. <laughs> and it was a massive heart attack. He used a lot of it as a lesson. Look, kids, this is what happens if you're a rock and roller all your life. And he blamed a lot of that health. He would express it to me anyway, that, that fast living is a, not the key to longevity. He just sort of told me, that's, that's the odd thing about it. And he just said, Dougie, you know, he told me, you know, I got it a year. And I went, what? He said, yeah, just like that. And that was the side of him I was talking about before, that what was painful, he wasn't going to let it out that way. I knew that he was in, in bad shape. Um, I knew that he was trying to get better. I knew that he had to be connected to machines every now and then, you know, <laughs> uh, oxygen tank. And I knew it wasn't good. You know, his hair was getting gray, and it was just this awful image. And so I think I really hid from him for the, for the last few months. So I don't have strong memories of it, except just like, just fear and just watching him sort of deteriorate, which I couldn't handle, you know. After a while, they communicated to him that it doesn't look good. So my dad was able to use that opportunity to tell all of us anything that was on his mind, and we were able to tell my dad anything that was on our minds on days leading up towards the end. Take a look around, see what you have found. It's so easy if you try, try, try. He took it as far as his little heart could go. Nothing more to be asked. That was good. Very honorable man. He used to say, oh, someday you'll be sitting with an interviewer and you'll be saying, oh, he was such a rogue and he did this and he did that. He'd put on an Irish accent to mock me, you know. But he also used to say, it'll be okay. You'll be a young, rich widow. You'll be all right. I, I, you know, and I used to say, well, that's all very well, I said, but I'll never forgive you. <laughs> this is how we used to talk. <laughs> I'll never forgive you for dying on me. <laughs> so anyway, I guess we kept it as light as we could. I remember one night, about a month before he died, we went out on the street and we walked about half a block and there's Harry's car. And we got in and he said, I just want you to listen to this with me. And he had a two or three tapes. He took them out and he put them in the sound system and we started listening to Harry's songs. And we must have listened for a couple of hours. And he played one after the other new ones, old ones, some, some that I'd heard before, some that I knew he'd written that hadn't gotten recorded, that he'd wanted to record, some that weren't finished. So they were all, but they were all wry and tender and funny and vulnerable and sweet and sour at the same time. We got to the end and the last song played and the tape player clicked and was silent in the car and we looked around and Santa Monica was quiet. It was just me and Harry in the car. And he said, well, he said, that's my life's work. He said, thanks for listening. And that's the last time I saw him. Turn on your radio, baby. Baby, listen to my soul. Turn on your nightlight, baby, baby, I'm gone. The last night of Harry's life, we'd had a very busy day. And uh, we went to bed and we were watching a movie, Enchanted April. I wasn't able to stay awake to the end of the movie and I said, oh, I'm sorry, Harry, I'm going to fall asleep. And he said, I want you to know I love you so much, making the so as long as he could. 
And that's the last thing he ever said to me. It's the perfect way to end a perfect day. I just remember thinking, the earthquake? <laughs> like, what's going on? You know? Who, who designed this series of events? I was at a friend's house in Topanga Canyon. It threw me half the way across the room. It was like, it was like Harry saying, hey! <laughs> I'm not going out like that, you know? Pay attention. Funeral was magnificent. Everybody came, a lot of people came, tons of people. Uh, and there was a feeling of um, great sadness at the same time, stories. Everybody started to tell each other stories. The stories I had never heard, stories probably inappropriate for a 10-year-old, but everyone had a good story to tell about him. Throughout the day, including the service, there were aftershocks, and quite severe aftershocks. So we're sitting there, and I thought, well, that's really kind of fitting, you know, because here's Harry, you know, even now he's gone, it's still shaking stuff up, you know, because we're just sitting there. And they could start in the casket would shake, you know, really surreal. There was a huge shake as they were, you know, during the funeral, and they said, it's Harry just got to heaven and found the bars closed. <laughs> when we went to the actual gravesite, we're all standing around, and George Harrison is there looking quite sad. And he looks at me and goes, you know my favorite Harry song? And I went, it's tough to pick. He goes, Fuck you. And I went, what? I'm thinking that he was like, and he goes, no, fuck you. Come on, let's sing it for Harry. And around the grave, six of us went, you're breaking my heart. You're tearing it apart, so fuck you. Looking at the casket. And when we did that, it was such a, a bittersweet sorrow, but there was not a man or a woman around the casket that didn't have that smile on their face that you said to me, Whenever I say Harry Nielsen, people go, Harry. And that smile at that time was all around.